Welcome to ISGIP Live's Journal Club for May 2021. While um, attendees are still joining, I will start with some introductions and housekeeping stuff. So I'm Natalie Benet. I'm broadcasting from Rhode Island. And um, my co-moderator this month is Dr. Samira Rashid from Cotter. Um, so welcome, Dr. Rashid. Let's see. And I wanted to uh, touch on some exciting news about Journal Club beginning next month. We are going global. So um, instead of me hosting every Journal Club from here in the East Coast of the United States, in June 2020, uh, Dr. Karen Talia will join as my co-host. So every other month, she will host Journal Club um, at noon her time in Australia. So that will be... Um, 10 p.m. the night before here on the East Coast of the United States and 7 p.m. on the West Coast of the United States. I think for most of Europe, it'll be the middle of the night, so they might have to rely on the recorded version. But remember, if you are registered, um, you will get an email with a video link 24 hours after the webinar broadcasts. And I would also like to make a plea. Um, that if you or you, someone you know or your trainee lives or practices pathology um, in this half of the world on the what I think of sort of like the Eastern Hemisphere, the people who would be awake, uh, please reach out to myself or Dr. Talia. We really want to increase participation globally in this ISGIP event for um, early career pathologists and trainees. And remember, um, you don't have to be a member of ISGIP. And before you present at Journal Club, um, we pick the articles and we practice ahead of time. So it's not as if you're going in cold um, and you do not need to be a member of ISGIP to present, but if you'd like to become one, you can do so. Just go to isgip.ca. The link is there along with all of the upcoming events for ISGIP. Okay. And this uh, upcoming events for ISGIP Live uh, are on the 26th of May at 12 noon Eastern time, a podcast with Dr. Natalie Buza will go live about HER2 new testing and endometrial serous carcinoma. Um, and Dr. Paraharan is on the webinar today. He is the host of that podcast. So thank you for joining us. And on June 4th at 12 noon Eastern time, we will have a webinar featuring Dr. Terry Longacre um, about female mesenchymal tumors other than uterine smooth muscle tumors. So looking forward to that as well. So the learning objectives for Journal Club haven't changed. These are the same every month. I do like to put them up here just so people can uh, you know, familiarize themselves with them. And also I put this handout in every slide just to give you an idea. Um, the participants are using a format that we've created and these are the basic questions that they try to answer in case you would like to follow along or use this in your own practice. Sorry, the 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 PowerPoint's a little slow. So the schedule today, uh, Dr. Rashid and I will give intros, and then um, we have three presenters, and this is the order we will go in. Dr. Rashid will introduce them um, shortly, and then we will have wrap-up and questions and discussion. Briefly, this is a Zoom webinar format, which I hope we've all become more familiar with these days, but the Q&A um, button is down at the bottom of your screen in that black bar. You can click there if you'd like to put a question for one of the participants, and you can also upvote the question using that up um, arrow and the thumb, where the thumb, the thumb right there. And the only other thing I would say is that at the end of the presentation, um, a survey will pop up, and please fill that out because we do use that to change and tweak future uh, formats and um, help people have access to this material. So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce my co-host, Dr. Samira Rashid, a GYN and breast fellow um, in Cotter, and now she will take over with uh, the rest of the introduction. So go right ahead. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be co-hosting this very interesting journal club today. This month's theme is sex cord stromal tumors of the ovary. The first article is Sertoli radix cell tumor of the ovary with follicular differentiation, often resembling juvenile granulosa cell tumor. So a report of 38 cases, including comments on sex cord stromal tumors of mixed forms, that is so-called gynandroblastoma. Second is rare DICER-1 and absent POX cell mutations characterize ovarian juvenile granulosa cell tumors. 
Third is a distinctive adnex cell, usually paratubal neoplasm, often associated with Pugh Stryker syndrome and characterized by STK11 alterations. STK11 adnex cell tumor are reported of 22 cases. All these, all three papers are from uh, American Journal of Surgical Pathology 2021. And these are our presenters. The first one is Dr. Miguel Gonzalez. He's PGY1 at Cedar Sinai, Los Angeles. Second is Dr. Mikhail Gorbanov. He is PGY3 at Warren Alford Medical School of Brown University. Third is Dr. Swati Bhardwaj, P PGY1 as Ikahan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York. Sorry, didn't mean to spoil the questions. Okay, so now we can have um, Dr. Gonzalez Monstera. You can share your screen and go ahead with your presentation. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this morning. Thank you, Dr. Benet and Dr. Sheet for this opportunity. Um, so yes, my name is Miguel Gonzalez Monstera. I'm a first year resident at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, as Dr. Rashid mentioned, the title of this article is Sertoli Leggy Cell Tumors of the Ovary with Follicular Differentiation, Often Resembling Juvenile and Granulosa Cell Tumor. A report of 38 cases, including comments on sex corpstomal tumors of mixed forms, so called gynandroblastoma. Uh, this article was written by Dr. Zira Rodulu and Dr. Robert Young from Mass General Hospital. Um, so, a little bit of background for this article is that when it comes to sex corpstomal tumors, there's been inconsistency in some of the terms being used. An example of this is the term gynandroblastoma. Um, this term was introduced uh, some years ago to define sex cord stromal tumors um, composed of both sertoli leggy cell elements and granulosa uh, tumor uh, cell elements. However, um, it was removed from the 2014 WHO classification for unknown reasons, uh, but reintroduced, interestingly enough, reintroduced in the uh, latest edition of last year, and it is currently defined as a uh, sex cord stromal tumors that harbors uh, you know, elements of both male and female differentiation. But even Dr. Young himself uh, actually prefers the designation uh, sex cord stromal tumor of mixed form rather than gynandroblastoma. So you see how there's you know, some inconsistent in the terminology, uh, terminology still being used. Another thing about these tumors is that, is that they have overlapping morphology. An example is also the granulosa cell tumors that are known to have some sort of totally like arrangements. Um, these tumors, also, um, also have like different patterns that have been described. Uh, these include follicles and pseudofollicles. However, the extent to which uh, Sertoli Leydig cell tumors may have follicles is unclear. So it is precisely the aim of the authors in this article to acknowledge this pattern based on their experience to make us aware that this pattern exists. And they provide you know, diagnostic criteria to differentiate it from other um, entities. Um, before I move on um, into the materials and methods, I just want to take a brief moment to talk about the uh, classification that there is in Sertoli Leydig cell tumors, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So they're generally graded according to the degree of differentiation of the Sertoli form uh, component, and the Leydig cell component just like diminishes in quantity as the grade increases. Um, so in the well differentiated one here, we see uh, it's formed by these well formed tubules um, that are you know separated by these. Uh, sheets of Leydig cells. In the intermediately differentiated or moderately differentiated, we lose the, the tubule formation. However, the, the Sertoli cells still remain as cords um, or just uh, irregular nests. There are still some Leydig cells um, also present. In the poorly differentiated, we see more like a solid or sarcomatoid growth of these Sertoli cells and Leydig cells can be, um, you know, there can be even absent. Um, these, the poorly differentiated and the moderately differentiated uh, sertoli cell tumors can also have heterologous elements, such as what we see here, the most common one being gastrointestinal type epithelium. Um, so, you know, this is just the background of, of this classification, as I mentioned. Um, now, going back again to the intermediately differentiated sertoli cell tumor, this is a low power, I want, you know, this is a low power view of what this tumor looks like, because this will become relevant further down, uh, down into our discussion. So we can see that it is formed by these uh, cellular nodules separated by edematous stroma. And here on the, on the right side, we have what a juvenile granulosa cell tumor looks like, also formed by these uh, nodules that are interrupted by follicles uh, that can have you know, eosinophilic to basophilic secretions. So I want you to keep these uh, pictures or images in your head because they will, as I said, become relevant um, later on. Uh, moving now onto the materials and methods, this is a purely morphologic study. 
Uh, the cases were obtained from approximately 500 cases of sertoli Leydig cell tumors from the consultation files of the late Dr. Robert Scully and Dr. Robert Young. Uh, from these 500 cases, 38 cases were identified based on a sertoli Leydig cell tumor being recorded as showing follicle formation. Now, cases were uh, considered to have follicle formations when the authors thought that this would be the designation that most pathologists would apply, uh, and cysts were excluded. Uh, moving on to the results, uh, the clinical features, uh, the age range of these cases was from 13 to 76, with an average of 28. Here's a graph. We can see that there's no cases in the first decade of life. Uh, the clinical presentation most presented with abdominal swelling with or without pain. This was in 20 of the cases. Six of these 20 also had androgenic manifestations. Um, 10 cases presented only with androgenic manifestations. Four were incidentally found and the clinical scenario was unknown for in the remaining four. Gross features, all tumors were unilateral. The size range went, uh, went from four to 35 centimeters. Uh, the section surface was predominantly solid and cystic, which is what we see here on this image. Um, solid in eight of the cases, and it was unknown in the remaining two. Moving on to the microscopic features, you know, the authors do claim that there was significant variation about but, um, but all tumors had a major component, which was these sizable lobules, uh, which were characterized by having multicentric follicular differentiation that ranged from five to 40% of the tumor volume with an average of 15%. Um, of the 38, 30 were of intermediate differentiation, eight were poorly differentiated. However, all of these uh, had zones of intermediate differentiation. They also mentioned that some of these had heterologous elements as well. So uh, what we can see here on, this, on, this, on these images is the early follicular uh, differentiation that arises from these solid nodules that are typical of sertoli Leydig cell tumors um, until eventually they become more, you know, more, more pale and edematous, the lobules become more pale and edematous. So this is very characteristic of, what, of this follicular differentiation. Um, this is another example of, of the follicles. We can see that these are of varying sizes uh, with basophilic to eosinophilic contents. The stroma where the follicles is located, um, it can be either pale pink, basophilic, or hyalinized. And these are the ones that resemble most the juvenile granulosa um, cell tumor like. So if you remember the, from the first image, it's quite a, quite a pretty resemblant uh, image. Um, so this is in contrast now to this, um, to follicles that did not produce a meaningful resemblance to juvenile granulosa cell like um, areas, such as this. this this follicle here that was present in, you know, they actually mentioned that I think it was 18 of the cases showed follicles like this that did not, did not grow of the particular um, pale uh, uh, follicles. So this was considered a nonspecific finding and just highlights the importance of uh, interpreting all of these results in the context of the background and overall findings. Uh, moving on to the discussion. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the aim was precisely to acknowledge the follicular differentiation as a pattern of sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Um, so with this article, they just want us to be aware that this differentiation is actually more common than it was previously, previously thought, which that has many times lead to consider gynandroblastoma or sex cord stroma tumor as a differential. But what they're saying, it's, it's not gynandroblastoma. It's not a mixed a, a, a sex cord stroma tumor of mixed form. It's just part of the spectrum of what a sertoli Leydig cell tumor can look like. So I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Ardula herself that she gave a couple of months ago on this article, and she made this analogy with carcinosarcomas. And she said that, you know, in the past, uh, not too long ago, carcinosarcomas were actually thought to arise from both epithelial and mesenchymal component. However, it is now known that it's all derived from the epithelial component, and it's just a poorly differentiated carcinoma. So basically what we're seeing here, it's, it's the same. It's, it's not two different components. And, in one, in one um, case, it's, it's the same, part of the same sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Um, so they also used some other aspects to, you know, that, uh, to consider this as being a sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Some of them are the clinical aspects, you know, the age of the presentation. It is well known that sertoli Leydig cell tumors present at an average age of 25, such as um, what we saw in this in the series, which where the average age was 28 as opposed to juvenile granulosa cell tumor, which presents at a younger age of 17. Also the androgenic manifestations that are typical of um, sertoli Leydig cell tumors. 
And they want them to emphasize, you know, the typical histologic characteristics of the follicles that they need to be arising from areas of intermediate differentiation. Um, and they just basically concluded that this is an unusual morphologic expression of Sertoli lady cell tumors rather than a true fossae, um, the true fossae of juvenile and granulosa cell tumor. And it just reflects the overlap in morphology that characterizes ovarian tumors. Um, to support their ideas and their conclusions, they mentioned some articles that I believe are worth mentioning right now. Uh, one of them is this one doc um, by Dr. Wong and his colleagues. Um, and, and colleagues. It's called Dicer 1 Hotspot Mutations in Ovarian Gynandroblastoma. So they took, a look, they took a look at 16 cases of gynandroblastoma here. And of these 16 cases, the ones that had components of both Sertoli Leydig cell tumor and juvenile granulosa cell tumor, they analyzed that these components and they saw that Dicer 1 mutation was present in both components. So if you may recall, Dicer 1 is actually is, has been, you know, um, associated with Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. So that led them to the conclusion that gynandroblastoma is composed of both Sertoli Leydig cell tumor and juvenile granulosa cell tumor may actually represent morphological variants of Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. So they basically arrived to the same conclusion, but at a molecular, you know, basis. This is another very interesting study by Dr. Kronesis and colleagues. Um, it was, so they, they took a look at 42 cases of Sertoli Leydig cell tumor and they, um, you know, they, they proposed this uh, molecular classification based on the status of Dicer 1 and FOXL2 uh, and correlated it with clinical pathologic findings. Now it's very interesting because the FOXL2, you know, FOXL2 uh, has been classically associated with adult granulosa cell tumor, but you know, it's recently been known uh, to be present in other tumors, such as this case of Sertoli Lady cell tumor. Uh, and interesting, it's very interesting because the mutation that they found in these Sertoli Lady cell tumors is actually the same mutation um, of the granulosa, of the adult granulosa cell tumor, which is the uh, C134G. So they, they classified it according to whether it had a Dicer 1 mutation. And these were clinically similar to what you expect to find in Sertoli Leydig cell tumors, which is a younger presentation and androgenic manifestations. These were moderately to poorly differentiated with um, retiform or heterologous elements. The FOXL2 muta uh, mutant tumors of Sertoli Leydig cell tumors were actually clinically similar to an adult granulosa cell tumor um, with abnormal uterine bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding. These were moderately to poorly differentiated without retiform or heterologous elements. And there was also the Dicer 1 or FOXL2 wild type, and these were well differentiated tumors. So, based on this classification, the cases that we present, that I presented, that we saw in this article, would qualify for this uh, Dicer 1 mutant, mutant category. Uh, so, in conclusion, the authors, uh, they just want us to, you know, they, they hope that mixed sex scorched stomach tumors, uh, this category should not include neoplasms irrespective of the amount of juvenile granulosa fossae in which a background origin from sertoli like cell tumor seems as the explanation for the morphology. And again, it's all part of the spectrum of sex scorched stomal tumors and specifically for this case of sertoli lady cell tumors. Um, some of the strengths and weaknesses of this, or of this article, I think the greatest strength is the experience of the authors. I mean, Dr. Young is probably the most experienced pathologist when it comes to these tumors. And they took a look at probably uh, the most extensive um, archives uh, in the world when it comes to these tumors as well. Um, on the downside, this is a rare entity. So it is likely that most practicing pathologists won't get a chance to, to, to see it. Um, areas for improvement, uh, given that this is a purely morphologic study, you know, it is conditioned to certain subjectivity. Uh, and of course, a molecular diagnosis will, you know, give much more accuracy. Some of the genes that could be analyzed would be Dicer 1, AKT1, or genus that are associated with juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Um, another thing that was interesting or caught my attention was this case that they mentioned that had 40% of follicular differentiation. So that, that to me just like seems like a pretty substantial amount and maybe giving a little bit more detail into this particular case uh, would have been you know uh, appreciated. Um, another thing is that the authors maybe could have considered uh, progenitor cells or reserve cells as a proposed etiology for this case. An example, you know, in the cervix, we have this in which the results reserve cells differentiate into either uh, into cervical glandular or squamous epithelium. So this might have been a, you know, another proposed etiology. 
um, applications of this article, mainly diagnostic. I mean, you want to, you know, diagnose the right tumor in the right category. Um, and since it's associated, since the Sertoli Lady cell tumors are associated with DOSHA-1 mutations, you know, um, this could also be part of DOSHA-1 syndrome, which, you know, encompasses uh, several other tumors. So a referral for genetic testing um, should also be considered. The, uh, that leads to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Sarah. That was great. And now I am for all the audience, I will launch the first poll, which should show up on your screen now. And I'll give you uh, maybe 30 or 45 seconds to go ahead and answer those, maybe a little more. For those watching this video, I just put the screen up so you can see the questions as well. Okay, just a few more seconds to get your answers in. Getting some clear winners here. Okay. Okay, I just shared the results. So Dr. Rashida is gonna walk you through the answers. It looks like the most popular answer for the first one was both, and for the second one was the second option. Yeah, so the first question is, which of the following tumors can show follicle or pseudofollicle formation histologically? So we usually, when we think of follicle or pseudofollicle formation, what comes into our mind is the juvenile granulosa cell tumor. But as this article has shown beautifully that both actually serotoletic cell tumor can also show follicle or pseudofollicle formation. The second question is, according to the article, which of the following features will support a diagnosis of Sertoli Leydig cell tumor with follicular differentiation over the sex code stromal tumor of mixed form? So as per the authors that multicentric follicular differentiation amounting to less than or equal to actually less than in most of the cases, 40% of the volume. So that was the correct answer. And the rest can be found in the gynandoblastoma or the mixed tumors as well. Okay. Thank you. I think that really summarizes um, well the um, key points of the article. And also at the end, we will um, have questions for all the presenters. So we'll hear more from them. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A section. And Otherwise, now um, we can have Dr. Gorbanov, you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll get to the second article. All right, one second. Can you see my screen? I can, yeah. Go ahead and make it full screen. We should be good to go. All right. Can you guys hear me relatively well? Yes, sounds good. All right. So uh, my name is Mikhail Gorbanov. I'm a PGY3 at Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, and my presentation today is about a paper called Rare Dicer 1 and Absent Fox Cell 2 Mutations Characterized Over and Juvenile Granulosa Cell Tumors. Okay, here are the authors um, of note, uh, McLuggage is bottom left. So the background of this paper, um, Foxal 2 somatic mutations uh, occur in high percentage of uh, ovarian adult granulosa cell tumors. And uh, DICER-1 mutations, as you've seen, are in high proportion of sectorally latex cell tumors. Um, by the way, just a brief uh, caveat, I'll be going over again some of the things that were discussed in the previous um, presentation. Um, 
So these mutations have only been studied in a limited number of uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumors, and their occurrence and frequency in these neoplasms is controversial. So ovarian granulosa cell tumors are uncommon neoplasms in general, but represent the most common malignant ovarian sex code stromal tumor uh, and account for about 2% uh, of all ovarian cancers. And they're split by the WHO into adult granulosa cell tumors and juvenile granulosa cell tumor. And the aim of this study was to determine the frequency of uh, FOXL2 and DICER1 mutations in a large cohort um, for uh, these rare tumors of 50 juvenile granulosa cell tumors and to evaluate the prognostic impact of these mutations. So here on the left, you have a um, very characteristic um, adult granulosa cell tumor um, showing microfollicular growth pattern um, with LX in their bodies, um, which are uh, composed of uh, monotonous tumor cells. If you can see my pointer with uh, nuclear grooves uh, and folds and scant cytoplasm uh, disposed around spaces filled with hyalinized material. So um, adult granulosa cell tumors uh, usually show a wide variety of architectural patterns um, from diffuse to uh, cord trabecular to insular, um, as you can see here, microfollicular slash um, showing calexner bodies. Less common patterns include gyriform, water, silk, macrofollicular, sarcomatoid, and pseudopapillary. While the tumor cells usually have uniform pale round to oval nuclei with irregular nuclear membranes, nuclear grooves, and scant cytoplasm. On the right, you see an example of a juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Uh, here, there is a vague nodular growth of irregular follicles. Tumor cells have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. And juvenile granulosa cell tumors um, display nodular diffuse architecture, scattered interspersed follicles of varying size, and have irregular contours and often contain basophilic secretions. Tumor cells uh, have round vesicular nuclei typically lack grooves and usually have abundant pale or eosinophilic cytoplasm. Now, I will move on to the methods of the paper. Um, they gathered 50 ovarian tumors diagnosed as juvenile granulosa cell tumors um, from uh, Hospice Civiles de Lyon, um, which they got 29, and Institute Gustave Roussy, um, within the French National Rare Malignant Ovarian Tumor Network um, between 2010 and 2018. Uh, they had representative slides, um, not the whole case to look at. Clinical information from uh, databases uh, and uh, initial and second um, pathology reports were used um, to gather clinical information. Following the results, uh, there are two specialists that had to confirm uh, the diagnosis morphologically, irregardless of the uh, mutational analysis for FOXL2 and DICER1 mutations, so they're blind to the results. So one uh, paraffin block uh, with at least 80% tumor was selected for the analysis. DNA was extracted using QM. And then um, they uh, built specialized primer pairs. Uh, for FOXL2 analysis, they had two primer pairs, one to amplify both wild type and mutant genes, and one just to amplify mutant. While for DICER analysis, they included two primer pairs uh, focusing around exon 26 and another one around exon 27, which would cover the regions that are, um, have been shown to have a somatic mutations initially described. And then they followed these um, amplification um, uh, melting curves, and when they saw deviation, they would follow that up with Sanger sequencing to confirm um, which mutations were available. Uh, Disease-free survival and overall survival were estimated using Kaplan-Meier method, and um, as I mentioned, uh, histologically, the cases were re-reviewed by two specialists to confirm the original diagnosis of juvenile granulosa cell tumor, blinded to um, molecular results. So the uh, population that they, uh, out of those 50 that they got, was um, um, age range of one up to 70 years, tumor range from 4.3 to 23 centimeters. Total of 44 cases were stage one, one case was stage 2A, and uh, one, uh, sorry, five cases were unknown. The general results were as follows. Um, on mutational analysis, two out of 50 of the um, um, patients uh, had a mutation. However, on the review of the two cases, they were reclassified by the two specialists as adult granulosa cell tumor. One of them was reclassified as luteinized variant of AJCT, and another one was uh, classified as AJCT. So at the end of the um, 
process, there were no FOXL2 mutants in this cohort. Uh, the Dyster analysis showed four cases that had um, mutations in the RNA3B domain. One of these was then reclassified as a gonandroblastoma uh, with a prominent um, juvenile granulosa cell tumor component. Plus, at the end of a, this particular analysis, um, there were three out of 47 Dyster mutants, which were pathologically confirmed, and no FOXL2 mutants. These are uh, the results for the mutational analysis showing the different protein changes that happened with the Dyster mutants. And then this is uh, clinical data, which ended up being uh, not significant with a high p value. So FOXL2 mutation was found in 4% of cases, but none of these were um, juvenile granulosa cell tumor at the end. And it's important uh, to distinguish adult granulosa cell tumor from ju uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumor, given the difference in behavior and prognosis. So previously, there are nine studies which uh, had included roughly 60 uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumors and looked for FOXL2 mutations. And these have uh, demonstrated roughly 5% um, of them with FOXL2 mutations. However, the author believes that similar to what happened in this study, that a lot of these may have been um, uh, actually misclassified adult granulosa cell tumors. So luteinized uh, adult granulosa cell tumor is especially um, prone to being misdiagnosed as juvenile granulosa cell tumor, given the abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm in contrast to the normally scanned cytoplasm of most AGCTs, and the relative lack of nuclear growth. Uh, this is a little bit of a um, re repeat of the previous presentation, but there are three molecular subtypes of um, SLCT. Um, they don't overlap, uh, with Dicer and FOXL2 being mutually exclusive and only being shown in moderately to poorly differentiated variants. And I'm going to go through all of this. Other sex cord stromal tumors, such as uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumor, adult granulosa cell tumor, unclassifiable um, sex cord stromal tumor and uh, gonandroblastoma have also been shown to harbor Dicer 1 mutants by lower rates. So the study supports that Dicer mutants um, are present in a small percentage of juvenile granulosa cell tumors, suggesting that the molecular abnormality is not specific for SLCT. And in the opinion of the specialist pathologist, uh, three of the cases with Dicer 1 mutants were juvenile granulosa cell tumors, while one was reclassified as a gonandroblastoma with components of moderately differentiated SLCT and uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumor. This is one of the most common combinations identified in gonandroblastomas. So um, they referenced this paper, Wang et al., um, which was uh, already, I think, previously touched on uh, Dicer 1 hotspot mutations in the variant gonandroblastoma. What's uh, important here is that out of these 16 cases um, of gonandroblastoma, uh, the juvenile granulosa cell tumor component was identified in roughly 10 cases. And mutations in um, the Dicer 1 um, RNAs uh, 3B domain were discovered in both tumor components in three of these uh, 16 cases. So both the juvenile granulosa cell tumor and the citrullulitic cell tumor. And none of the 16 cases showed a mutation within the plexion homology domain of AKT1, which is usually seen in juvenile granulosa cell tumor. So our conclusion um, in, for this specific data was that the gonandroblastoma is composed of SLCT and uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumor may represent morphological variants of pure um, SLCT, which is characterized by high frequency of mut mutations of DICER1. So in reference to that paper, um, the authors of this paper um, are saying it's theoretically possible that the three cases of juvenile granulosa cell tumor um, with Dicer 1 mutants in this study may represent a gonandroblastoma in which the SLCT component was not sampled or was not included in slides that were reviewed. As I previously mentioned, they didn't have the whole cases as they were um, reference cases. Interestingly, um, in the study um, of Wang et al., uh, there were also no duplications in the pH domain of AKT1, which uh, was found in um, 
what it was found in any of the gonadoblastomas, and um, this further suggested the pathogenesis of gonadoblastomas containing a juvenile granulosa cell tumor component is fundamentally different from pure um, JGCT. Uh, the observation is further, uh, further supports um, hypothesis that gonadoblastoma of component of JGCT is biologically closer to SLCT than JGCT. So in conclusion, uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumors are uncommon neoplasms that may cause diagnostic difficulty to pathologist or morphological overlap with a number of other sex work stromal tumors, including adult granulosa cell tumor, especially luteinized variants, um, citrullinated cell tumors, gonadoblastomas. Molecular, molecular testing for FOXL2 and DICER1 mutations are useful for correct classification of such neoplasms. FOXL2 in this case uh, seems relatively specific for diagnosis of AGCT and not found in um, JGCTs. Uh, adult granulosa cell tumors contain um, this uh, FOXL2 mutant in over 90% of cases. And then nicer one mutants are, um, as well as occurring in significant portion of SLCTs, um, specifically moderately and poorly differentiated versions, are present in a small percentage of JGCTs, 6% uh, in the current study. So for areas of improvement, um, uh, the, the first one is actually kind of the um, a strength and a, a area of improvement because for these rare tumors, this is a really big study, but it's still only 50. And then when you have um, only three positive cases, it's really hard to uh, get an end that's good enough to um, tease out the clinical outcomes. Um, then they didn't have the full cases for review, which, um, then um, this is the possibility that they undersampled and in reality, as a result, misdiagnosed um, a gonadroblastoma. In terms of applications, uh, as I previously mentioned, FOXL2 somatic mutants um, uh, occur in high percentage of AGCT and no JGCTs, so it can be used to differentiate AGCTs that do not have classical morphology or could be misconstrued as JGCTs. Uh, this is a uh, nice little review article pointing some of the morphological differences and the mutational differences between the two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gorbanov. That was great. You can stop sharing your screen now, and I will go ahead and launch the polls, which Dr. Rashid will walk us through. So they should be appearing on your screen now. We'll give you about a minute to answer those. And I will also bring up the poll questions on the screen for those watching this video. Oops. There you go. Okay, just a few more seconds. Okay, looks like we're, ooh, this one might be kind of controversial. Okay, so everyone should be able to see the results now. Dr. Rashid, you can go ahead and walk us through it. <laughs> Yeah, so the first, uh, so this paper, it talks about differentiating adult granulosa cell tumor from juvenile granulosa cell tumor and the reason behind it. So why should we uh, differentiate adult granulosa cell tumor from juvenile granulosa cell tumor? Is it because of the better prognosis and rare recurrence, molecular characterization and targeted therapy? or because there is excellent prognosis of adult granulosa cell tumor, or is it the difference in treatment chemo versus surgical resection? And the answer is the first one, that the juvenile granulosa cell tumor has better prognosis with rare recurrences that are mostly within the first three years. The second question is, what is the recommendation for patients with DICER-1 mutated ovarian tumors? So this paper also mentions the DICER-1 mutation that 
is associated with Dicer-1 syndrome. And these patients, they can have other tumors like pluripulmonary blastoma and pediatric cystic nephroma. So it is it recommends a referral to genetics for consideration of germline testing. No. Let's share that. Okay. There are the answers for those watching on the video. And now we can go on to our third presenter, Dr. Bardwatch. You can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. All right, so um, I'm Swati Bhardwaj. I'm a first year resident at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. And I am uh, somehow. Okay, so today uh, I'll be presenting this paper that introduces an exciting new entity that was described by leading gynecologic pathology experts from all across the world, led by Dr. Bennett from University of Chicago. And this entity is called uh, a distinctive adnexal, usually paratubal neoplasm that's often associated with fuchs jagger syndrome and characterized by STK11 alterations. Uh, for short, it's called STK11 adnexal tumor. It's a report of 22 cases. So uh, the syndromic association of sex cord tumors was first of all described in 1970s by Dr. Scully when he observed the association of sex cord tumor with annular tubules with butz jagger syndrome. Subsequently, butz jagger syndrome was also found to be associated with Sertoli cell tumor. Since then, a number of syndromic associations have been described, such as juvenile granulosa cell tumor with Ollier disease and Mafuchi syndrome, and Sertoli Leydig cell tumor with Dyser-1 syndrome. And uh, in the past few years, there have been rare reports of adnexal or paratubal neoplasms in butz jagger's patients which have variously been considered to belong to sex cord stromal family or Wolfian tumor family. In fact, there have been uh, recent reports of tumors belonging to Wolfian tumor family categorized as female adnexal tumors of probable Wolfian origin. And the authors included 15 cases uh, in this study, three of which they later on found out with more experience were actually very distinctive neoplasms with uncertain histogenesis and they categorized these tumors as STK11 adnexal tumors. And in this paper, the authors described the clinical pathologic and molecular features of this entity and also discussed their differential diagnosis. So the authors procured a total of 22 cases from institutional archives and consultation files and also from PubMed literature by searching for various terms and uh, studied the clinical information and follow-up information retrieved from medical records or uh, by the referring pathologist. They also noted the macroscopic features such as the location of tumor and tumor size and reviewed h &E slides that varied from 1 to 42 per case. Uh, they did immunohistochemical evaluation for various epithelial markers, sex stromal markers, hormonal markers, GATA3, CD10, and scored the IHC markers for extent and intensity of staining, followed by next generation sequencing using targeted Onco Plus panel at the University of Chicago. And for five cases, uh, this sequencing was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So coming to the results, STK11 tumors have a wide age range of presentation, ranging from 17 years to 66 years, with a mean age of 40 years and a median age of 39 years. And out of 22 cases, eight patients had butz jagger syndrome, that is around 45%. The clinical presentation varies from uh, abdominal pain, abdominal pelvic mass, uh, urinary tract symptoms, and uterine bleeding, while three cases were incidentally detected. The tumor size ranged from 4.5 centimeter to 25.5 centimeters. The location of tumors is distinctly paratubal. So 18 out of 22 tumors were paratubal, with five showing direct extension into the ovarian or fallopian tube wall or lumen. Two were seen to be arising from the ovary, one extending to the uterine serosa. There was one tumor that presented with multiple abdominal pelvic nodules and no dominant tumor mass could be identified. Uh, on follow -up, at the time of presentation, 50% of the cases, 11 cases, that is 50%, had metastasis at the time of presentation. 
So these are figures showing the location of tumor. In the first one, there is extensive involvement of the ovary. Second one shows the fallopian tube lumen and tumor in the wall of fallopian tube. And in the third one, again, extensive involvement of the fallopian tube wall by the tumor with just barely remaining fallopian tube epithelial lining. Grossly, most of the tumors, 11 were solid, seven were solid and cystic, and only one tumor was entirely cystic. The key feature is that the histology of these tumors is very diverse, showing a spectrum of morphologic patterns and features. But the most common one was interanastomosing cords and trabeculae as seen here, with few showing cysts and myxoid matrix, a cribriform pattern that is reminiscent of a salivary gland type tumor, or closely packed microacini. There were seven tumors that showed a solid growth pattern with broad columns of tumor cells or large nests punctuated by acini with basophilic secretions. Eight tumors showed a whirling architecture, which in one case had a vaguely glomeruloid appearance. And there was one tumor with nodules in an edematostroma. Few tumors, uh, so two tumors showed macrocystic uh, appearance, probably because of a degenerative change. And there were papillae with edematous cores or eosinophilic cores. A villoglandular pattern was also observed. Five tumors showed the presence of microacini that mimicked metanephric adenoma in one case, as seen here. There was one tumor that showed a distinctly biphasic pattern uh, reminiscent of a phyloids tumor. So there is a glandular pattern and there is an edematous sort of stroma. Although most of the tumors had a columnar to a cuboidal cell shape, but a spindle morphology was also observed in 40% cases, and spindle cells were, uh, cells were predominant in two cases, as seen here. These are epithelioid cells. Uh, rare nuclear grooves can also be seen. The tumor cell cytoplasm ranged from clear to eosinophilic, and the nuclei were round to oval with prominent nucleoli. In three cases, the tumor showed two distinct kinds of cells. So we can see these large cells with sort of rhabdoid morphology and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm with surrounding cells with scanned cytoplasm. There were nine tumors with nests showing a vaguely squamoid appearance and two tumors showed a signet ring type morphology. A bland mucinous epithelium was also observed in one tumor in the form of strips or glands uh, lined by mucinous epithelium. And incidental sex cord tumors with annular tubules were observed in ipsilateral or contralateral ovary in nine cases microscopically. Overall, the tumors had a high mitotic rate with a mean mitosis of nine per 10 high power fields. And necrosis was seen uh, in six cases, four showed uh, tumor cell type and two showed infarct type necrosis. Now coming to the immunohistochemical features, most of the tumors were positive for epithelial markers. So CAM 5.2 and A1, A3 was positive in most cases. CK7 was positive in around 65% cases. And Claudin-4 was consistently negative, so 0% positivity, either not performed or not positive. Among sex cord markers, calretinin was positive in 100% and inhibin in 90% cases. SF1 was occasionally positive in 30% cases, while Foxil-2 was consistently negative and no staining was observed. TTF1 was also consistently negative, while GARA3 and P63 positivity was seen in one case each. WT1 was positive in all cases, and 81% cases showed CD10 positivity, 75% cases showed D240 positivity. The tumors were also positive for hormonal markers, around 60 to 80%. Okay, so coming to the molecular features, the key feature of these tumors is the presence of STK11 alterations. Out of 22 neoplasms, uh, molecular analysis was possible in 21, and pathogenic STK11 mutations were observed in 71% cases, while 14% showed variants of uncertain significance, and 14% showed STK11 deletions. Among seven patients that had Peutz Jagger syndrome, four showed pathogenic variants of STK11, two had variants of uncertain significance, and one had a deletion in STK11. Additionally, recurring copy number alterations included loss of 1P and 11Q and gain of 1Q, 15Q, and 15P. Follow-up data were available for 68% patients with the mean uh, follow-up time ranging from 8 to 132 months. 27% patients were alive and well at the time of follow-up, 40% were alive with disease, 20% dead of disease, and 13% dead of other causes. Recurrence was seen in 80% and metastasis was seen in 50% cases. 
One recurrence showed elevated testosterone levels that became undetectable after excision. Other than these, there were no endocrine or paraendocrine manifestations. Okay, <clears throat> so STK11 adnexal tumor is a newly described entity described for the first time in this paper. They have a broad age range, ranging from 17 to 66 years, with a diagnosis of Peutz-Jäger syndrome in nearly 50% cases. However, no other distinctive clinical features are seen. They commonly have a paratubal origin and have rare endocrine or paraendocrine manifestations with one recurrence that we saw earlier. The gross features range from solid to solid cystic in most of the cases. Behavior-wise, these are malignant neoplasms with a locally infiltrative pattern and an aggressive clinical course. They have diverse histologic patterns. So the patterns range from chordate, trabecular, salivary gland type, solid, papillary, with a strikingly myxoid matrix. On immunohistochemistry, they're positive for cytokeratin, most sex cord markers. SF1 is typically negative or focally positive, while FOXL2 is consistently negative. The key feature is the presence of STK11 alteration, often with loss of heterozygosity and copy number variations in 1P and 1Q. Three tumors also showed STK11 haploinsufficiency. So the first differential to be considered for these tumors is uh, adnexal, fallopian, uh, female adnexal tumor of Wolfen origin that is also paratubal, that also has a varying histologic appearance, but it has a key characteristic feature of a sieve-like morphology and has low-grade cytology and rare mitosis, which is uh, opposite to what we see in STK11 tumors. These tumors lack a myxoid matrix and lack recurring molecular alterations and are presumed to be derived from mesonephric remnants. Another differential is sex cord stromal tumors. STK11 tumors, like sex cord stromal tumors, have a similar immunophenotypic profile. They also show nuclear grooves and are generally EMA negative. However, the morphology of STK11 tumor does not resemble any known sex cord stromal tumor, and they lack FOXL2 expression and associated FOXL2 mutations and DICER1 mutations. Sex cord tumors show loss of heterozygosity at 19p, that is the site of STK11. However, none of them harbor an STK11 mutation. Mullerian adenocarcinomas, such as endometrial adenocarcinomas, can also be considered in the differential because of the gland-like or tubular morphology seen in STK11 tumors, and also because of the presence of squamoid foci and broad spectrum of epithelial marker and uh, WT1 positivity. However, Mullerian adenocarcinomas are positive for Claudin-4, which is not observed in STK11, EMA, and Pax8, and rarely exhibit inhibin positivity. And STK11 mutations are virtually non-existent in Mullerian adenocarcinomas, with few exceptions. The authors also considered mesotheliomas in differential diagnosis because of the characteristic location and because some architectural pattern similarity, uh, because of positivity for WT1, calretinin, and D240. But mesotheliomas grow as plaques and diffusely in contrast to discrete masses or nodules seen in STK11 tumors. Mesotheliomas lack isolated STK11 mutations and lack hormone receptor expression, which was seen in STK11 tumors. Moreover, the authors studied the electron microscopic features of STK11 tumors and did not find any evidence of a mesothelial origin. Salivary gland neoplasms must also be considered in the differential because of the characteristic cribriform type of morphology, even though they are never described in a paratubal location and rarely described in ovary and they're characterized by a dual population of cells not seen here. So STK11 tumor is added to the ever expanding spectrum of neoplastic processes seen in Peutz-Jäger syndrome, which in descending order include a sex cord tumor with annular tubules, certainly cell tumor, distinctive sex cord tumors of otherwise uncertain nature, mucinous tumors, and extra ovarian lesions like gastric type adenocarcinomas of cervix and mucinous metaplasia of fallopian tube. So uh, to summarize, the four distinctive aspects that characterize STK11 tumors are a paratubal or adnexal location, a diverse spectrum of microscopic features and morphologic patterns accompanied by a myxoid edematous matrix, an association with Peutz-Jäger syndrome seen in around 50% of the cases, and the key feature that is recurrent STK11 alterations. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this paper. It describes uh, this exciting new entity and uh, the evaluation of clinical pathologic features and follow-up with molecular characterization is very thorough. However, the origin or the histogenesis of these tumors uh, still remains an enigma and the authors propose that uh, there can be further proteomic or transcriptomic analysis 
That's a further area of research to find out the exact origin of these tumors. Overall, it has very important applications because if you are aware of these histologic features, it should prompt us to do STK11 mutation analysis to uh, look properly categorize these tumors and also to look for Peutz-Jeghers syndrome in patients in whom this diagnosis may have been missed. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, excellent presentation as always, Dr. Bardwaj, a Journal Club veteran at this point. Okay, so I will um, launch the polls now for Article three, and go ahead and start answering those. Okay, just a few more seconds. Looks like we're getting some winners, Dr. Rashid. I'll let you walk through the results with everyone. Okay, so the first question is, what is the most common histological feature of the STK11 at next cell tumors? So we know that it's uh, it has a diverse uh, uh, spectrum of histological features, but the most common, as mentioned in this article, is the uh, answer that most of the people chose that is densely cellular with inter anastomosing cores and trabeculae. The second question which of the following represents the IHC profile of STK11 at next cell tumor? And yet again, it's the one, the correct answer is the one that most people voted for. It is positive for CK, WT1 inhibin, and negative for SF1, FOXL2, and GATA3, which will differentiate it from the other differentials that Dr. Bhardwaj mentioned. Great, and those were both overwhelmingly the most popular answers. So I think the audience at least has, has internalized that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my Screen now and the panelists, everyone who's here, you're welcome to turn your cameras on. We did have a few comments. Um, one, uh, Dr. Bardwaj, someone asked, um, are these tumors bilateral? I uh, did not find any data. I was just looking through the paper again on whether or not they were unilateral or bilateral. I think so that, I that under gross features, yeah. oh yeah, I mean, I, I think they were all unilateral. Um, yeah, I think so. That is, that was my impression as well. So, um, yeah, we will check on that. And then uh, I just realized I was looking at a paper. <laughs> so uh, there was also a comment about, I believe it was Dr. Gorbanov's presentation, um, that many of the adult granulosa cell tumors with poor prognoses from the literature were maybe misclassified. That folks have gone through and done some studies about that. So, thank you. Um, Dr. Carnezis, Kern he's in the audience, and he, um, I think Dr. Gonzalez Mancera, you also quoted or cited one of his papers, and I think um, Dr. Gorbanoff, you did as well. So he made that comment. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, and let's see. Um, another thing that I just wanted to comment on as a theme for all of your papers, and hopefully um, at least a few of you are going to pursue, and uh, Dr. Um, Rashid is already pursuing a career in GYM pathology, but um, the theme that I see running through all of these is that they are um, rare tumors and that in order to study them well and really get to know them, you have to be in a place that is doing high volume GYM pathology, right? So all three of these papers have in common um, the fact, I mean, two of them have in common almost like this, 
the same institution to a certain extent. And Dr. Young, who, um, as Dr. Gonzalez and Sarah mentioned, is one of the world experts on these tumors. But also this idea of aggregating the cases. And in the case of the French paper, um, having a cohort of people with follow-up so that you know you can look back at a, a tumor from 12 years ago and know where that patient is now and hopefully know how they're doing and if it came back. And if it came back, what did it come back as? And what did it look like when it came back, et cetera? And I think that's the way we're really going to understand these papers or these tumors. Um, and the other thing I, I thought was interesting is that there was a morphology only paper, which is uh, very interesting because a lot of the people who are tune, tuning into this um, webinar are in places in the world where they don't have access to FOXL2 mutational analysis or something like that. So if you do get the dreaded luteinized adult granulosa cell tumor, you know, you just have to do the best you can. And I think it's really good that there are morphologic studies and these papers, even the ones with molecular analysis, do such a great job laying out molecular details to sort of match up with your tumor that you're seeing if you don't have access to molecular findings. But I think um, there was also an anonymous comment about, you know, the molecular subtyping of these adult granulosa cell and juvenile granulosa cell tumors. And I think as time goes on, that'll become more refined. But it is a good point that a lot of the, the literature is based on morphology only before the advent of, of molecular testing. So, oh, okay, Dr. Uh, <laughs> we have another author in the, um, in the audience, Dr. Ordulu is also here, and that was her comment as well. So, um, so thank you all for being here. And um, does anyone else have, Dr. Rashid, do you have any questions or comments since you are my co-host? Um, yeah, it's the, the, I don't know, I think it's, it would be an unfair question, but still, I was just wondering, the first paper mm -hmm. that Dr. Gonzalez presented regarding Sertoli Ladix cell tumor, it's great. And it's it's just uh, the like the way it has mentioned the percentages and they noticed that the percentage is less than forty percent. Just I I was wondering like how much like this different these two differentials how much it affects the prognosis or um, how how much difference would it be like making that different uh, differentiation between these two in the management or in the in the prognosis of these patients, because he uh, he mentioned a very good analogy of uh, carcinosarcoma. So I guess this will be uh, it. The, would it affect the uh, prognosis? Like, th will these tumors have same prognosis as Sertoli Ladix cell tumor? Um, so, uh, my understanding is that uh, well, that's still unknown. Um, we don't have that information yet. Um, as of, mm -hmm. like, as far as I know, it's it's still not affecting prognosis, but I think, you know, since this is a newly um, yeah. discovered or uh, <laughs> differentiation or pattern, we still don't, don't have any. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Ordulu helpfully put a comment, to help you out, <laughs> Dr. Right. Gonzalez and Sarah, that it would give you an idea about Dicer 1, but not necessarily about prognosis. So um, it is a, like I said, it's a it's a, a paper about morphology from from one of the world's experts, so certainly um, should be taken into consideration. Um, that's a that's a good question, though, Dr. Rashid, because it's a uh, especially in, in parts of the world where they might not have access to you know dice or one mutational analysis. It's a good a good point. Um, so I think those are the points I had. Um, I think all three of you did a really excellent job, and I appreciate it. Um, I know these are esoteric uh, tumors that. Even, oh, there's a question. Oh, it's the same question. Okay. Um, that you might not even see that much in your residency. So um, I appreciate you coming on here, especially if you're not planning on pursuing a career in GYN pathology. But um, thank you all for being here and thank everyone in the audience. And please fill out your evaluations on the way out the door. Okay. Thanks thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rashid.